Pleasant good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Dr. Jacqueline Roden Trader, Associate Professor and Chair of the Criminal Justice Department of Coppin State University, and your moderator this evening. On behalf of President uh, Dr. Anthony L. Jenkins and our Provost, Dr. Leonte Lewis, I welcome you and we're delighted that you have joined us. This is Coppin State University's three-part web series on African-American women and the 19th Amendment in recognition of Constitution Day. Constitution Day commemorates the formation and signing of the United States Constitution on September 17, 1787. The series is being brought to you by Maryland Humanities, supporter of educational experiences that promote dialogue about our heritage, culture, and our future as Marylanders, and Coppin State University's Constitution Day Committee, comprised of Dr. Mary Wanza, librarian, Dr. Claudia D. Nelson, Chair and Associate Professor of Applied Social and Political Sciences, Ms. Melissa Rigby, Senior Web Developer, and yours truly, Dr. Rodin Trader. We are grateful for Maryland Humanities sponsorship and the Constitution Day Committee's five years of dedicated service to our institution. You may be asking, why have we done this? Or why are we doing this? Well, first, we're doing this to edify the populace on the importance of understanding and guarding their constitutional rights and privileges. Secondly, we are adhering to a federal mandate. As of 2004, federal regulations require institutions that receive federal funding to provide a program for students every September 17th about the Constitution. Coppin State University is an institution that receives federal funding and therefore presents this program in, in compliance with the legislation. Thirdly, August 2020 marked the centennial of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which was passed on June 4th, 1919, by the United States Congress, guaranteeing all women the right to vote. Regrettably, African American women were not guaranteed the same rights and privileges as their white counterparts, and were not able to fully cast their votes until the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Ponder that for a moment, then ask yourself the following questions. Why did African-American women have to wait so long to cast a vote? Why is it important for African-American women and historically marginalized groups to exercise their democratic right to vote in all elections? To answer these questions as well as others, this evening, we are delighted to present a long walk for African-American women 125 years journey for voting rights. Our third masterclass speaker is Dr. Claudia D. Nelson, Chair and Associate Professor of the Department of Applied Social and Political Sciences at Coppin State University. Her topic is, The Struggle Continues, Preserving and Protecting Our Voting Rights, 1965 through 2020. Dr. Nelson is a native of Bronx, New York, and a twice graduate of Clark Atlanta University in Atlanta, Georgia, with a doctorate in political science and master's in African American studies. She earned a bachelor's degree in business administration from Lehman College, Cooney in Bronx, New York, and is currently a tenured associate professor at Coppin State University. Most recently, Dr. Nelson serves as an inaugural Anchor Institution 2020 Fellow, was named a 2017 to 18 American Council on Education ACE Fellow, and in 2012 was selected to participate in the HERS, Denver Summer Institute, 
And in 2010, for the National Women's Studies Association, NWSA, Women of Color Leadership Project. As a scholar activist and political scientist, Dr. Nelson merges her intellectual work and activism and engages in teaching, research, and service grounded in the intersectionality of race, gender, and class as they inform the lives and lived experiences of women of color. Her dissertation, African-American women's activism undergirded by sisterhood, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, a legacy of social and political action, 1913 through 2006, was the foundation for the book, Advocacy in Action, 100 Years of Social Action in Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, published by Dreft for Delta's centennial celebration. It is Dr. Nelson's goal as an educator, scholar, and researcher to engender a greater understanding, appreciation, and respect for the indubitable contributions African-American women have and continue to make to the broad socio-political landscape. Ladies and gentlemen, sit back in your tent doors and get ready to be enlightened by Dr. Nelson's exegesis of a long walk for African-American women. Join me in welcoming my colleague, Soror and friend, Dr. Claudia D. Nelson. Thank you, Dr. Roden Schrader. Um, I am smiling because it only takes a friend and a soror to introduce you like that. And so I am so pleased that I have the opportunity to be here with everyone today as we present our third masterclass for our Constitution celebration. As Dr. Roden Schrader shared with everyone. We do this because it is a federal mandate, but we do it because we love educating everyone about their rights. And so I am going to take an opportunity to take that needle and thread, if you was with us on Tuesday, Wednesday, and here we are on Thursday, and thread all of those wonderful errors women, women organization, struggles and defeats together as we look at this next era of 55 years of African-American women and the work that we do as advocates, social action, political awareness and involvement. We are involved on the international world stage. And so tonight, I thank you for joining me and I will share my screen so that we can begin the presentation. And so for our discussion, and it is a discussion, I know you will not be able to verbally ask a question, but we ask you to send any questions to our Q&A as we engage in this conversation. The struggle continues, preserving and protecting our voting rights. I am happy to be your guide. Today is September 17, 2020. It is the day that the federal government sets aside for the education of the Constitution. But I want to start with this quote under the title, Oh, to be an African-American woman. And I'm quoting Mary Church Terrell. We have heard about her in our first presentation by Dr. Edmonds. Her name was evoked last night by Dr. Jones, and here she is again. And you may ask yourself, if we are looking at various epochs in our long journey, how can a woman named Mary Church Terrell be a part of that discussion? She lived from 1863 to 
1954. Thus, her work is threaded throughout the century. But she was someone who had privilege, yet also understood oppression. And she wrote in her book, A Colored Woman in a White World, and I will read. But the white women of England and the United States have only one burden to bear. After all, the burden of sex. What would they do, I wonder, if they were double-crossed, so to speak, as the colored women of this country are? If they had two heavy burdens, two loads to carry through an unfriendly world, the burden of race as well as that of sex. And that is the intersection of our conversation Black women standing at the crossroads of race and sex when it comes to their fullness of citizenship through that vote. And so we are going to take a journey and look at the preamble of the Constitution. So while we're here, we're here to talk about African American women and their journey and their vote, but you need to put it in context. Here we are in 1787. There are white males who come together. They do not come to make a new union. They come to talk about what is taking place under the Article of Confederation. Out of that convention, we end up having the United States of America Constitution. And the preamble states, most of you know, we, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves, our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Just like today, Everything takes time. So we celebrate September 17th as the date in which it was created, but it was not ratified because within this document, nine states had to ratify the Constitution before it becomes law. So it's presented and ratified June 21st, 1788, and it does not go into effect until March 4th, 1789. And our constitution is known as the most stable document across the world where many try to model their constitutions after. We the people. This is an imperfect document, but it lays a foundation for the perfecting of an imperfect union. So if you live on the East Coast and you're wondering, you were a colony that became a state, when did your state ratify this constitution? So here's a map. Um, you'll get a copy of the PowerPoint. So if I go a little fast, you'll be able to find your state. But the slow journey begins to ratify the constitution. For your knowledge, the Constitution that we have today was not the Constitution that was ratified. The Constitution that was ratified consisted of the preamble and the seven articles. Article six is what makes the Constitution the supreme law of the land. The long, and that's not a typo with all the O's. It has been a long road to full voting rights for African-American women. And as we learned in our first um, evening, when and where I enter, the whole race enters with me, Anna Julia Cooper. When and where I enter, until African-American women fully can enter into this society as full citizen, all are still held captive. So the road that she had to take from enslavement through the Civil War and what we end up after the Civil War is reconstruction. And yes, my colleagues started the Tuesday and Wednesday sessions 
in their period, but none went through the historical context of this road for African-American women in terms of the constitution. Some did. And so what I'll do is just bring us up to date really fast. Civil War Reconstruction Amendment 13, 14, 15. And one of our colleagues talked about the 15th Amendment. That amendment gave males, African-American at that time, not called the right to vote. It did not include black women nor white women. So we come to, and that's 1870, 50 years later in 1920 with the 19th Amendment, which we are celebrating as the centennial. And the 19th Amendment is what we are focusing on in terms of what the United States is looking towards suffrage for women. And it reads, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. So you would think that with the 15th and the 19th Amendment, that Black women would finally be included in this opportunity. It was a long journey. And I pick up from my colleague last night, Dr. Jones, who said, I know Dr. Nelson is probably going to talk about Fannie Lou Hamer, and I will along with others. But we never really mentioned the 24th Amendment. And so I'm going to talk to you about the 24th Amendment because it is those impediments that get in the way of the fullness of the 15th and 19th Amendment that creates the obstacles for all people of color to vote. And so when we have grandfather laws and literacy tests, those were obstacles put in place to overt the amendments. And so the 24th Amendment states, the rights of citizens of the United States to vote in any primary or other election for president or vice president, for electors of the president or vice president, or for senators or representatives in Congress shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state by reason of failure to pay any poll tax or other tax, which was another impediment put in place for people of color. Here we have the scene, let us set the stage. I pick up in 1965, but you can't really pick up in 65 without looking at 1963 and 1964, which begins that push for our landmark um, legislation. And so here we have um, in 63 and in 65 and 64, the push continues with the um, civil rights movement. And I'm going to play a clip here from Miss. Fannie Lou Hamer. And so what Fannie Lou Hamer was talking about was this idea of having representatives who do not represent you and how you needed to stand up if not you, then who, to run against them. What's significant about that clip that I wanted you to see that most of us may not have seen is that she is actually running in 1964 for a seat in Congress. Most times we hear about her with her speech um, before the Democrat National Convention, but in this speech here, she's also talking about how she's sick and tired of being sick and tired and how they tell us that we should be satisfied. And she's pushing the envelope in terms of Black women putting their physical bodies in the space in order for them to be heard and to be represented. African-American women in politics, therefore, we know that it is not into the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act that African-American women were finally included in the full realm of formal American electoral politics. Black men and white women with the ratifications of those two amendments had long had access to the ballot. And it was this third class citizenship 
that led to the political marginalization of African-American women. This marginalization created a vacuum and rendered Black women's activism invisible. And what we end up finding is that we have a cadre of women coming out of this period who begin to write about African-American women, African-American women and the vote. But also looking back to that period of 63, when we know as the March on Washington, Dr. Dorothy Height writes a piece about it was during that march in that period that they realized that only Black women could speak for themselves. Because even in the great cause for civil rights, civil rights, Black women were sidelined, marginalized. And you begin to see this, this mushrooming of women um, in, the, in the academy, women in politics, women advocacies groups, women defining themselves because they realized that they had to write their own stories. So in order to understand African-American women's political behavior and activism, we must be receptive to broaden that concept. Joel Prestige writes a piece um, looking for the political Black woman. Joel Prestige is the first African-American woman to earn a PhD in political science. And so that political woman shows up in 1968 in the Congress, Shirley Chisholm. Her tagline, byline, motto, persona, we can call it anything, but we all know it's unbossed and unbought. And what was happening after the passage of the 1965 legislation, and we know because we heard about in 1964, the civil rights um, legislation, is that we are given the opportunity to have access to the capital, not just as onlookers, but as representatives. And Shirley Chisholm represents a district in New York, in Brooklyn. And it is her run and her win, and then she have others to begin to join her, like Barbara Jordan, and beginning to then be at the seat, bring at the table, bring in their own seats. And we all know that Shirley Chisholm has a remarkable, um, there's a remarkable documentary about this period in her life. And when in 1972, she runs for the highest office in this nation for the presidency. What begins to happen with Black women and other women of color as we're coming out of the 60s into the 70s is this awakening of their power that they're pulling from their foremothers that we've learned about. Now their foremothers created institutions that still live on today. The National Association of Colored Women is one of those associations, um, one of those organizations. But in 71, you end up getting women of color and other women supporting women to um, actually form the first politically facing organization to help women run and earn um, the right to be at the table with the National Women's Political Caucus. Their tagline, recruit, train, and elect, they still are in existence today. And from their organization came many organizations designed to help women gain access on the local, the state, and the national level. Today, when you look at the many of women of color who are running across the many levels of government, you see that they are indeed making a difference. And if you look at these pictures that's from the National Women's Political Caucus um, website, um, it's about she speaks for herself, giving more voice and more agency. It has always been about how do we speak for ourselves as we also speak on behalf of our communities. 
And so from this here, what we start to see in this journey, in this struggle of protecting and preserving our vote is that you're living in a system that although you have the legal rights, you're always being confronted with localities and states and national governments that are trying to peel back and to repeal the gains that have been made. The Black political woman, people are scared of her. Why do I say that? When you understand the, the discussions and the pushback that was taking place in the early part of the 19th century about women's right to the ballot, that journey began in Seneca Falls in the 1800s. And it would take 70 years to get to where we are in 1920 with the ratification of the 19th Amendment. But there was this discussion about the power and the impact of Black women's vote. Because if you don't know, prior to 1920, there were states that were giving women the right to vote. And so when you go west of the Mississippi, women had the right to vote by 1920. When you get to the state of Illinois, Illinois is a state where you do have a concentrated amount of Black women in Chicago that can turn a vote. And they demonstrated that through the leadership of Ida B. Wells, whose name we heard Tuesday night, Wednesday night, here we are on Thursday evening. What she was able to do was to work with the women of that community to elect the first Black Ottoman. When they did that, it reverberated to show that Black women had agency, Black women were organized, Black women could turn an election. This is before 1920. So the whole discussion about Black women and the vote is about Black women's power and agency to turn the vote. So what is the political Black woman? How do you define a political Black woman? I want you to think about in your own minds and you can put it in the chat. When you think about politics, and we want you to chat, when you think about politics, what comes to your mind? Who are the players? How do they become players? Why is it important to engage? Also, what does it mean to be Black, African-American? What does it mean to you to be Black if you're Black, African-American if you're African-American? What does it mean to put the two together, Blacks and politics? And then, what does it mean to be a woman? Throughout this nation, history, that has been a central point about what it means to be a woman and who is a woman. That's what Aren't I Woman was all about. That's why Black women in the club movement was fighting. When the newspaper person outright slandered Ida B. Wells and all Black women with insult, Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin said, we must let us confer. And all Black women gathered together and out of that came the National Organization in 1896. What does it mean to be a woman? And then what does it mean to be a Black woman? Do you know any? Are you one? Your mother, your sister, your cousin, your friend? What does it mean to be a Black woman today? What principles, what struggles, what burdens must she bear while she is still fighting for her full citizenship here in the United States of America? Now, Black women, master of all trades. We do it all and we do it for all. And what we do can be defined in many ways. 
And oftentimes we're doing the work and we don't know how to define it. It is our activism. It is our involvement. You do it daily from the moment you get up until you go to bed, but you don't know what it may look like. But Kimberly Springer offers an elaborate definition of our activism in her book, Still Lifting, Still Climbing, which was the motto of that 1896 organization, Lifting As We Climb, the National Association of Colored Women, Still Lifting, Still Climbing, African-American Women's Contemporary Activism, which includes all of us in this period, she notes that defining activism encompasses the myriad tactics African-American women employ to confront sexism, classism, heterosexism, and racism. African-American women's activism generally takes two forms. And I'm gonna talk about these two forms. And while I'm talking about them, I want you to type in the chat, where does your activism fall? Is it direct action or is it indirect action? distinctively intellectual activism or both. Direct action is activism involving face-to-face -face interaction with members of the community. Are you out there getting people registered to vote? Are you out there making sure they get to the polls? Are you a part of or are you founders of organizations to get out the vote? It entails the provision of social services, running for public office, self-help health activism, organizing prison ministries, gender integrated organizational work, unionization, paid work and social movement organization. Where does your activism lie? Distinctively different from direct action, and here we are on a, co um, a campus at Coppin State University, where I know we have many students here, we have many educators, K through 12, I know we're on here, and K through 12 plus four, we're on here. Intellectual activism, what does it include? It is, but is not limited to writing as resistance. When you pick up someone's autobiography, that is resistance. Mary Church Terrell, a colored woman in a white world. Kamala Harris has her autobiography, Stacey Abrams, her autobiography. These are writings of resistance, but also ownership. Michelle Obama, ownership of your own story. It includes political education, consciousness raising, the autobiography I just talked about for political witnessing. Autobiographies are key because it's not always just about the person. What it is about is the era, the struggles, the laws in which they had to become. And their becoming had to do with them entering in their full citizenship. Have you issued any public statements in major newspapers? Many organizations do that. Many organizations say, we stand for, we stand against, we will not stand for, we will protest, we will stand for Black Lives Matter. What is your contribution in this long journey? And I know we all have to do this fight every day for her story. Everybody who know me know that has been my tag since early 90s, her story with an IE. Always making your story your story because you have to fight these images. And so I want you to list some images that I may not have here that we've had to fight over time, defining ourselves by others, Sapphires, mammies, welfare queens, queens, wanton, hoochie mamas, gold diggers, chicken heads, the other words that we have to fight against every day as we are educators, activists, mothers, sister friends, community leaders, political players, but we still have to fight for our right to be women, black women. African-American women 
in this place called the United States of America. How do you define yourself? What words defined you? Put it in our chat. Organizations. I talked about 1971, beginning organizations for women, um, coming together for themselves, realizing that they cannot tie themselves to a seemingly male-dominated movement. That although Anna Hedgeman and Dorothy Hyde were at the tables at the meeting for the March on Washington, if you read what they wrote about their experiences of being pushed aside, and whenever they wanted to interject, you should have a woman speak. They tell them how they have women a part of SNCC, women a part of NAACP, women a part of Urban Leagues. They said, but we want a woman to speak on behalf of women. And that fight is not a fight that's well known or talked about, but they write about it and is in that moment that we take ownership beyond our putting our race first because we cannot separate ourselves from ourselves we cannot just be black african-american woman of color negro and then be woman we cannot separate ourselves and that is the whole notion of intersectionality that Kimberly Crenshaw talks about. It is that whole notion of your standpoint that we talk about, who am I? I am an intersection of many things. I am not just one thing. Therefore, my politics is not going to be just one thing. Today, I can be hyped and be a liberal. Tomorrow, I can be ultra conservative, but it's about the issue. And that's what we need to focus on in our voting about issues and about using our collective just like josephine st ruffins knew convening black women let us convene together that's what the national associative colored women and the national council of negro women that was started by mary mcleod bethune also led by dr height and now being led by dr cole these women are pushing us to come together, even in our various organizations, to use our collective energies, our collective power, our collective sisterhood. When we get excited about the potential of the first woman of color to be the vice president of the United States of America, when she speaks, she speaks to us collectively. When she talks about her sorority, she talks about the divine nine, understanding the power in the unity and not the disunity. We have to come together. So a great example of coming together is the Black Women's Round Table, where we find that Melanie Campbell pull Black women from all areas, walks of life together to come and to talk about and to be about and to work about that which involves women of color, Black women everywhere. If you haven't been to any of their programs, conferences, if you haven't been to the Congressional Black Caucus Legislative Weekend, which are more than just the weekend, when you enter into a room for the Black Women's Roundtable, the room is filled with women, Black women, women of color, women who are supporting and still fighting and going for that long journey because the mantle has been passed to us. Log on to their website. It's a part of the Coalition on Black Civic Participation, which is another organization that was 
created so that we can have our own data, look at our own truths on how we're voting, where we're voting, who we're voting for, how can we work together so that we can have political strength. I teach political science and I teach my students this, power, power, power. That's what voting is about, power and access. And if you don't have them, you are always left to others. I know we have people on this um, webinar who are currently running for office themselves. And I just want to give them a shout out. You know who you are. If you want to put it in the chat and say, I'm running, put it in the chat. We have people who are running, who are stepping up, ordinary people who say, I too can have a voice. Congresswoman Macbeth, personal, became her political fight. The personal is political, is about what we do. Higher Heights, out of New York, Black Lives Matter, other organizations that's continuing this long fight. As we looked at the organizations of the 1800s and early 1900s, here are organizations in this century that's still carrying the banner, still fighting for the right, still organizing, still fighting, pushing back, because although we've looked at the 15th and the 19th Amendment, the 24th Amendment, and the 1964 Civil Rights Act, and the 1965 Voting Rights Act, it's not done. We can't rest on our laurels. We have the gutting of that 1965 Voting Rights Act, the pre-clearance, which is extremely important. When you have an opportunity please go and read about it. I can't teach about it, but if you want to have access to one of my classes, we can get together and we can talk about it. But when you've had the poll tax and the literacy tax um, 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 put in place to counter people's right to the vote, and now we're having voter IDs, that's another way to suppress the vote. Purging, another way to suppress the vote. Those things are happening today, not 1960s, 1950s, today. And so organizations like Higher Heights, Black Lives Matter, um, organizations, and this is an academic, research rich. You have got to visit Rutgers Center for American Women in Politics website. It is the jewel in understanding women and politics, women's journey. Um, they also have many um, scholarly, which means it was research, data and information that can help you understand your role in all of this based on not just what has occurred, and they have a wonderful historical database, but what is occurring. You can go there now and look at all the women that are currently running, it looking at all of the opportunities to get involved. This is a webinar that's going to take place beyond the 19th Amendment, a century of growing political power amid unequal suffrage, talking about unequal people of color, women of color, not being able, even in this age, if you know what happened to Stacey Abrams in Georgia, you understand when I say in this age, when you have someone who can suppress the vote because he's scared about what happened in Illinois prior to 1920, Black women being able to turn a vote, Black people being able to turn a vote. This was a clear indication of someone knowing they were in trouble. So when you look at Stacey Abrams and you look at what she ended up doing, she was doing many things prior to, to, to running for the governor of the state of Georgia, but she started what is called Fair Fight. And that is a great resource. I know I have some Georgia people on, um, on this um, webinar. I have some New York people. That's why we have higher heights pointing out things that are in your backyard that you can reach out to. 
and get your information. The struggle continues. What must we do? Time has the time is short. I can't even I can't even believe it's already 620. In doing this work, and this is my work, it is my passion. Um, black women, I love the work that we do. We do the work in our organizations, and I must talk about it since Dr. Roden Trader highlighted 100 years of social action in Delta Sigma Theta. When you look at how that organization was involved along the way and what they're doing today, going to the nation's capital and lob lobbying in the sense of advocacy, not lobbying in the sense of trying to get a, 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 um, a sidekick. Lobbying is not a bad word, is what we do. We advocate, all of us advocate for the people and the issues. And Delta Sigma Theta has perfected doing it on behalf of those who cannot do it from themselves. So I hail that organization, but I want you to hail your organizations that's doing the work and put it in the chat. Let us know what organizations you're a part of, that you know of, that you will align yourself with, that is boots on the ground, working to make sure that their communities are informed, their communities are registered to vote. And let me stop there. If you look at all the data, many people registered to vote. We have perfected that. It is the turnout. We have got to get people to the polls. And in this era with the pandemic, what we need to do is also peel back the 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 fearful tactics being placed on people concerning early voting or absentee voting they're the same they're just called different things in different states i have voted early i have voted absentee i will do the same it is a pandemic i am not leaving the house but you should have already, and check your state, you should have already requested your ballot. And if you have not, you need to do so. I think that if you don't, you may find yourself having to go the day of, and you will have in some places suppression, in other places, you may just have a sheer um, dearth of people being able or willing to serve as poll workers. And so please early vote and you can do it by mailing in. In the state of Georgia, what they have here is boxes, actual mailboxes that you can go and drop your ballot in also. So you can do that or you can go early into a space. And when you do that, cast your ballot. However you do it, I say get it done and get others with you to get it done. This is a critical time. I will not be like everyone else and say, this is the most important election of your lifetime. They're all important. Why? Because African-American people, people of color have always had to fight. The struggle continues and it's real. And so as I've done this work over time, I thought about what can I say to people to get them motivated? The demand for women to organize and to work to combat the growing inequities and equalities between the haves and the have-nots is so evident. If you ever watch the Davos conference where they're talking about the, the, the growing division between the haves and the have-nots, Globally, it is astronomical that the 1% own just as much as the 99%. So the inequalities between the have and the have-nots could not be more apparent. In order for realized change to occur, the practicability of African-American women's activism, having the same kinds of impact and import of centuries past that we have heralded these past few nights, is predicated on Black women, those who support them, 
their ability to do the following six things. And I want to read them because I want you to hear them organize. And we see that across the spectrum that there's this, this wheel of organizing. Um, and I know you may be zoomed out, but there are so many wonderful organizations that have put their conferences online. So if you can't watch it real time, go to their video. CBC, excellent. The Asala, excellent. They actually are in conference now. Um, go to our website, Coppin State University, to our Constitution Day link, and those links are already there for you. Commit to strengthening um, our political community by building local, national, and international coalitions. The local is so important, but the local is global. Personal politics is important. Women get into and they galvanize. And when I say politics, politics is not just about running for office. Politics is about voting, getting others to vote, educating, doing what we're doing today getting us informed. We need to engage in meaningful discourse and action that intentionally seek the best interests of disenfranchised and marginalized people. Don't use those communities, be a use for those communities. Work hard to close the gap between grassroots politics and traditional politics. All politics matter. When people in the streets grassroots that is needed. When people are in the halls and the corridors, that is needed. There is not one that is above the other. They work in tandem because we must close that gap between the community and intellectual activists. Influence and pressure lawmakers, influence and pressure lawmakers and policymakers to set public policies that benefit all people and make communities take responsibility for conditions that are caused by internal factors that are within its ability to control. That's a whole other conversation. So what do you think? We brought you Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday through the century, looking at Black women, Negro women, colored women, African-American women, and their fight and their contribution, engaging you as those women today, though, those who are on the front line today, and I look forward to reading all that you've put in the chat about your work. Tell us about what you're doing. Provide resources in our chat so that others can also be informed. But what do you think? Have African-American women reached a point in American politics where their two-ness is no longer a burden, but an asset? Remember Mary Church Terrell talked about that burden of being both her race and her sex? In 2008, Black women made history when it came to voting. Hear this. Black women made history. Proportionately, they were the largest turnout that brought Barack Obama over the finish line and into the presidency. My question came out of that period. Have African-American women reached the point? It was in that moment that we can go back to Illinois where black women, data, if you don't believe me, go to the data, Brookings report, and look at the Brookings data on in the Pew report, in the Pew research on Black women's turnout in 2008. Don't underestimate the power of Black women wherever you are, not just for this electoral period. You have elections every year in your communities. Those are the places that really matter the most. Vote for your local leaders and your state leaders and for referendums. Understand what those things mean. Don't just go to the ballot blindly. The good thing about getting your ballot mailed to your house, you have time to sit down and become one with it. 
be one with your ballot because the choices you make will make a difference for generations. And what I would like to say, one vote does matter. If you're on your phone, on your laptop, just Google how many votes, how many elections have been won by one vote. And you'll be surprised how even on a presidential election, how one vote mattered. Your vote matters. Do not let anyone discourage you, frighten you. And I am just excited about the work that women, Black women, and when I say Black women, I do mean 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds, 20-year-olds, 91-year-old women that are still engaging in this fight. It will never be over. Don't let anybody tell you that. It passes from one generation to the next. It is your time. It is your generation. And if you don't believe me, just pick up that wonderful piece that John Lewis penned for us before he closed his eyes. And when he penned it, and it's in the New York Times, he wrote it to the generation, not including himself, as he passed the mantle on. There are so many passing that mantle on. And we have to be good students of the work that they did, learn from them, and continue the journey. Listen, these women, on the first night, our uh, master class presenter talked about saying their names. In your space, say their names. We say, say her name as a hashtag, but I've been saying these women's names for decades. Sojourner Truth, Mariah Stewart, Harriet Tugman, Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin, Gertrude Marcel, Anna Julia Cooper, Ida B. Wells Barnett, Mary Eliza Church Terrell, Nanny Helen Burroughs, Mary Margaret Washington, Mary McLeod Bethune, Shaletta Spears Bass, and Anna Honor Arnold Hedgeman. These were our 1800s sisters, mothers, foremothers, but they did not have what we have. And there's no reason and no excuse for us not to do more than what they have done. They built institutions, they built higher education institutions, they made a way out of no way with not having the 19th Amendment on their side, the 1965, 1964 legislation, but they fought so that we can have them. And so Ida B. Wells, Mary Church Terrell, Mary Margaret Washington, Mary McLeod Bethune, our early foremothers, takes us to Ella Baker, Dorothy Irene Height, Frankie Muse Freeman, and Fannie Lou Hamer, who I started with, and we will share that with you. Too many to list. That's why I want you to go to the center for um, women, American Women in Politics at Rutgers University. Take time just to go there. You will get lost there with the rich learning that will be provided for you. Shirley Chisholm was elected. We are now looking at Kamala Harris being our vice president. That is a long journey that is not over yet. So as I began with her, I shall end with her, Mary Eliza Church Terrell. While I am grateful for the blessings which have been bestowed upon me and for the opportunities which have been offered, I cannot help 
wondering sometimes what I might have become and might have done if I had lived in a country which had not subscribed me and handicapped me on accounts of my race, but had allowed me to reach any height I was able to attain. Do any of you ever wonder what else you may have been able to achieve had not someone, something, some system suppressed and oppressed you where we could be today if it had not been? But because we are still here today, we know that all things are possible. I thank you for being with us this evening. I welcome any questions. Dr. Roden Trader, thank you. Dr. Nelson, thank you. This has been wonderful. Uh, the way that you traversed uh, the 50 years, 55, 65 to 2020, looping in the former presenters. Remarkable, remarkable. And I say kudos to you. You can't hear all the other claps, but since I have the mic, I'll be here. Thank you. Very well. Uh, and to our audience, at this juncture, we are going to entertain questions and answers. And so I now ask that you would uh, write in the Q&A section uh, the queries that you have, and I will then pose them to Dr. Nelson, and uh, thereafter she will respond, and I will continue as time affords. We do have a few questions that were listed earlier, and the first, Dr. Nelson, is, do you find that African-American women identify more with being African-American or being women or a woman? Shirley Chisholm said she found that she was more susceptible to discrimination based on her sex. Many women may find that to be the case. But she also says that because she's a Black woman, she's also discriminated against. You cannot separate the two. It is also a personal experience for people to know whether it is their sex or their race. But when you look at the journey, African-American women, you cannot choose. And that's the beauty of the work and the scholarship that takes place where we learn that it is not either or, it is both and. And so to that question, both and. And that becomes part of the power that comes out of the scholarship because people want us to choose between our two selves. And we cannot. Many of us will have personal experiences that one will manifest. But when you stand before someone, you stand before them as a Black woman. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, another question is, when the media discusses the suburban woman as a voting block, do you think that people think that that description as, or think of that description as white women? And why would that be? Great. When we talk about what it means to be a woman, this is not a 2020 discussion. The cult of true womanhood is the foundation of what it means to be a woman. And to be a woman is code word for a white woman. It has always been. And therefore, we have to always fight for that inclusion. I'm sure many Black women on this webinar live in the suburbs, but it does not connote an image of her. And so it is definitely 
embedded in white supremacy, inferiority, superiority, dogma, that those become code words. And that's why we end up having our um, Sojourner Truth talk about this. He, um, talk about this in terms of, aren't I a woman? What does it mean to be a woman? And so you got to push back every time when people try to polarize us in using terms like that. And, um, and so it is code, mm -hmm. but what we find in today's society, and when you do turn on the news today, people are pushing back because even white women are pushing back against it because it puts them in pigeonholes them into this category that they want to refute because it then connotes someone who stays at home also and their husband goes out to work, which is not always the case. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, excellent response. Um, next question, do you see a point in time that black women will be valued by their strength, experience and knowledge rather than by quota? And the second part of that is, how long will it be that women will honestly be created equal? Never. And why I say that, because when we enter into a space, Black women bring with them an essence, a history, and a fight. The fight is there because there's always people trying to exclude her. And so when they're trying to exclude her, what ends up happening is that she is marginalized. We are in 2020. That question should not have had to be asked in 2020, giving the long journey. It is a never ending fight because you will always have people fighting for you not to be included. And so this is always about exclusion. And yesterday when we talked about universal suffrage, that has to do with the fact how black women look at the vote, that it is for everyone but not everyone wants it for everyone. Mm -hmm. And so I say never because when you think it has happened and you stop, you will wake up one day and find that things are chipping away. So, and that's not to be negative, it's to be pragmatic. Pragmatic in understanding where we are and where we live, but it's also an opportunity for strength, knowing that you are still carrying the banner to make sure that even when those and others want to relegate us to the sidelines, we still show up. Thank you, thank you, thank you. My, my, you've got me being pensive here, but I need to focus on my responsibilities as moderator. Alrighty, another question, Dr. Nelson, is uh, what do you think about the voting scandals as far as mailboxes being taken from urban communities? Let's go back to poll taxes, literacy tests. Um, these are all ways to suppress the vote. So what do I think about it? I think you always have to be vigilant knowing it's going to happen. You cannot think that things are fair. There is not a fair playing ground. We would like it to be, but we have to then be in the room and in the place so that it can be fair. And so we also have to monitor the things that are taking place, um, knowing that they will happen and have our own counter reactions, um, have our own people on the ground monitoring 
Um, don't think that it will be fair. Always work for it to be fair. Always be engaged. Always have your foot on the ground. Be a part of the solution. But never lose sight that there's always going to be someone somewhere fighting for you not to have what is yours. And that, in this case, is the right to. And so this is a local, a state, and a national fight. And that's what we see what's going on now. There's nothing new, but we have to stay ever vigilant that we are doing our parts, and particularly through these organizations that I had shared, doing their part to let people know what to look for. And when they see it, what are some of the counteractions that they can take so that we can make sure that every vote is counted, every vote is counted. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, thank you so very much. Um, another audience member says that one of um, their dear white um, female friends has been publicly supportive of Black Lives Matter and racial equality movement. She re recently said that white women will be the ones to bring positive racial change because they see the injustices and are married to and raising the white men. Your thoughts on that, Dr. Nelson? Absolutely. You'll see it across the spectrum that we looked at that there are white women in the fight and in the struggle along the way. They too face their own um, um, personal dilemmas when they want to fight for the cause, be it abolitionist cause, civil rights cause, um, and then in this fight for Black Lives Matter. What you end up finding is that it, the solidarity is there but you can't let people co-op your intentions. And I think that sometimes that was, if I heard the question right, how they would be the ones to save. Um, no, we need you to work with us so that we can um, find a way to make a better way. White women, um, the National um, Women's Studies Association is a wonderful example of that because you have a lot of white women who, come and talk about um, anti-racism, anti-sexism, um, fight against uh, white supremacy, have really good dialogue and training about what this looks like and what it means and how they are also um, um, a part of the oppression and, and looking at it and seeing how they can also render um, um, help in this area. So by no means do we ever say that white women um, have not been there, but what we do know is white women can jettison us also. And we saw that um, in terms of even the 1913 march down Pennsylvania Avenue um, and the, the thought of not letting black women march because Washington DC was in the South and not having um, to deal with the Southern um, men in terms of their support of women getting the vote. And in that case, therefore, white women jettisoned Black women because they wanted to secure the vote. And so you will have those coalitions, but you also need to also be mindful that it is also personal politics and people will fall in line where it matters most. And that's what coalition building is about, that no one group can do it alone, but we have to earnestly work together and sincerely support the cause that is being raised. Um, and so they're always welcome, have always been welcome and have always been there. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, another uh, audience member would like to know, what advice would you give young black girls? Mm -hmm. In general, um, that sounds like a general question. So what I'll answer it is that they have to be students of history. 
if you're not students of history, you don't understand your connection to the world. You may think what you're thinking has never been thought. What you want to do has never been done. But when you learn from history, it also strengthens you because the things you want to do and the things that you're thinking becomes solidified because you have women who have shown you the way. But every generation makes their own way. And so we give room for their ingenuity. We give room to their ability to use the technology of today. Every generation have technology. I don't want people to think that this is the only generation that have technology. The fax machine was technology, okay? That means you could send a piece of paper someplace else over a line. That was technology. Uh, when Fannie Lou Hamer spoke in 64, TV, black and white, was technology. When Ida B. Wells got on the steamboat to go to, the, to Europe so that she can plead the cause for anti-lynching, she used the steam and then sent that information back in terms of newspaper. That's technology, that's communication. All generation have it. Um, this generation have it on steroids, but use it in a way that you can help and not hinder. Don't, don't create problems, solve problems, work together. Don't hate, celebrate. We're, there's enough for all of us to do and enough for all of us to receive. And so I say to young people, be who you are, love who you are, get in good trouble. And we know who said that, John Lewis. And that was his mantra, but it was also his, his words to that generation get in good trouble. I teach this and I always tell my students, when they think of a John Lewis or Dorothy Hyde, when they think of, of, of Ida B. Wells, they see them as old people because they've aged. I tell them they were you. They are the college student. They are the 18, 19, 20 year old making America listen. So, Delta Sigma Theta, walking down Pennsylvania Avenue, college students making the world listen. And so, young people, if you are a student of history, you will see that it's young people that make the world listen. Thank you. Thank you. And um, to sort of piggyback on what you just discussed, what a viewer would like to know, how have your students' consciousness changed over the years regarding their two-ness? Absolutely. Um, I call them my academic babies. And these are the ones who have graduated, but we're all still connected right now. Some of them, if they're on right now on the webinar, if you're, if you're not too shy, just type, I'm Dr. Nelson's academic baby. I get all kinds of, of, of text messages in the moment that they're doing something that brings what they learn to the forefront. I received a message um, from someone who was a African-American student, woman, African-American woman, but she's worked now in Annapolis for a state senator. Something is happening in this country um, with all the protests. I get a text message. I remember when you were teaching us about Ida B. Wells. I, and then she goes through this litany that confronts her two-ness in 2020, being a black woman. Their consciousness is raised because they connect to the history of the people that have gone before them. And so what ends up happening. I received an email when John Lewis transitioned from a student who was a Coppin um, 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 King, um, a student who was our, our senior class president. Uh, my students are very involved. Um, their consciousness raising is taking place on campus. They are the leaders on our campus. And he sends me a message and he says, Dr. Nelson, 
I just want to thank you when you made us, and he put made in capital letters, made us have to go listen to Congressman John Lewis when he visited our campus. And not only did you make us go, you made us buy the book. And he sent me a picture of the inscription. This is a few weeks ago. That's how you know about their consciousness. Beyond them being in class and regurgitating for an exam, when they've gone on and they've graduated and they still reach back to you and say, because you taught me this, because you introduced me to this person, this is how I see what is happening today and why I'm reaching back to you to say thank you. And so they are, I come from Clark Atlanta University where we were unapologetic about blackness and teaching about blackness and being um, um, proud of who we are. If you go to their website and look at the political science um, program, it clearly states. And so I come out of that teaching of a Du Bois who was on our campus and James Weldon Johnson, who wrote the um, Black National Anthem. Um, and so we're unapologetic because it is history. We're not making anything up. Our history is American history. And they take that with them. And that consciousness level, their consciousness over time continues to grow. And I can say that they do reach back and they say, I learned this in class, and I can now connect it to what's happening today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, there are two queries that are still in the chat, and so I will honor them. And then thereafter, we will then uh, wrap up. Uh, the first is, uh, what are your thoughts on congressmen and their, um, the time frames they have in office? Should uh, the length be uh, similar to the president's two terms still, because most of them, the men still take part in old practices of women not being involved in politics as a result of their long tenures? Excellent. So we're talking about term limits here and what should be the term limit. And right now, um, term limits are determined by citizens. I, I'd say you hire them, you fire them. And so because of that, there is no constitutional um, term limits for your House of Representative or your senators. Should there be term limits? Absolutely. How long? That is negotiable. When I say we know that it takes time to get things done. And so you can't send, and we'll talk about the House of Representative right now, where they're elected every two years, right? And so they are constantly in that campaigning mode. When they get to Congress within that, that year, they're gearing up to run again. And so if you're constantly trying to protect your seat, then how much real governing you are actually doing. And so for them, I say that, that, that you can serve probably 10 years to get something done. That would be five terms, and then it would be over. I think in 10 years, if you haven't done anything, then you don't need to be there. The Senate is six years. And so they already served longer than a, um, the president's first term. And so if they end up with two terms, then they are actually serving 12 years. And so, and because the Senate is set apart from the House, there are only 100 senators and 435 um, members of, of, of the Rep House of Representatives, uh, they, they, they work differently. And so if you're looking at about a two or three year term limit, you're looking at upwards of 18 years. And I think that is sufficient. Um, and so I do believe in term limits and I hope that we can get there. Um, there's a whole lot we can even talk about, you know, do we need the electoral college process in terms of determining mm -hmm. our president? Um, and so um, th these, but these are all great questions because it pulls the citizens in to this discussion. And so um, thank you for the question because it talks, that helps us to get into Congress. And when you do go vote, and this is a presidential election, 
you do have down ballot, be sure you know who you're voting for and not just because they have name recognition. Many people get sent back because most people haven't done their due diligence to see what other candidates may be bringing to the table. And so it is incumbent upon us as the citizens to make sure that if you're not doing your job, you can release them of their duties. Yes, ma'am. Thank mm -hmm. you, thank you. And our final question, Dr. Nelson, is, do you believe that because the right to vote was such a personal struggle and fight for Black women from the beginning, it makes them more truthful and committed as politicians in their conviction to uphold their political promises to the Black community in terms of uplifting and improving our communities? Well, I'm glad the word in there is uplift because it's tied back to the notion of race men and race women. Those were exceptional titles to carry because it was about lifting as we climb. Innately, I believe, as a part of the DNA of Black women, shouldering everything for her community it is innate for her to be true. That doesn't mean we're going to find those who are untrue because people are people. But when you look at their platforms, it's clear that it is the personal that is political. When Shirley Chisholm went to Congress and they wanted to put her on a, on a committee for farms, she, um, for um, rural committees, she said, her constituency is not there. You know, put me on a committee where when I have something to say or contribute to, it contributes to my constituents. They are accountable or feel accountable to their constituents and by extension, the Black community. And if you look at many of the websites for many of our organizations, um, no matter where they may be located, it is always this notion of, quote, unquote, the Black community, right? Um, where we know that we are not myopic, um, we are not um, 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 single-minded, but this notion that what works well for most will work well for all. So if I'm fighting for the right to vote here in Georgia, that's going to work well. And if you go to Stacey Abrams, Fair Fight, although it says about Georgia, it's about the nation. If you go to higher heights, they're in New York. But if you look at it, if you're on their distribution list, they have you meet with women from across the United States. They are vested in making sure that we may come from different places, but the fight is for all of us. And so in doing this work and being around women of color who I've had the actual opportunity to talk to them about their, their work in this arena, it is always about the community and always about what they can do. And then they also understand that as Black women, they are under the microscope. You got to understand what somebody else can do and get away with it will never sell with you. And so you're constantly making sure that you are dotting your I's and crossing your T's and you have to be twice as good, three times better. You have to excel in everything you do because someone is always waiting for that opportunity to bring you down. And I think that is why they do stay committed to the work in that way. Thank you so very much, Dr. Nelson. Uh, yeah. This has been absolutely wonderful. Uh, the number of persons who stayed throughout the entire presentation is indicative of how you captured the audience. And so uh, we thank you for edifying us. It's been wonderful. And so uh, I would like to say heartfelt thanks to Maryland Humanities for sponsoring the web series, which we, the committee, absolutely believe has edified our listening audience. 
like to thank our remarkable speakers in the series, Dr. Joseph L. Tucker Edmonds, Dr. Ida D. Jones, and yes, our very own Dr. Claudia D. Nelson for not only edifying but inspiring us to rise to the call of social action and be agents of social change as modeled by the unbossed and unbought African-American women of yesteryears. We thank them and honor them for their long walk for African-American women, you, and women all over the diaspora, me, and their 125 years journey for voting rights. Heartfelt thanks to our IT specialist, Ms. Kelly Jackson and Mr. Robert Harper for their outstanding technical support without which our broadcast would not be possible. To you, our listening audience, thank you for joining us, be it for one session, two or three. We implore you to encourage one or several African-American women to exercise their rights afforded yet denied to them in the August 1920 ratification of the 19th Amendment and demanded in the 1965 Voting Rights Act. The struggle continues. Persevering and protecting our voting rights, 1965 to 2020. A pleasant good evening to everyone. And Dr. Roden Trader, yes, what I'd like to say to everyone, if you want your copy of a constitution on behalf of the committee, if you would email us, we will send you your copy of the Constitution. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you all and a pleasant good night. The recordings uh, will be made available through our IT specialist. Thank you.